Good evening, everyone. This is an incredibly special night for the Office of the Appellate Defender. Tonight, we are celebrating our 25th annual, first Monday in October, gala and mock Supreme Court argument. We are also celebrating 30 years of indigent appellate defense service. OAD was founded in 1988 in response to a crisis in the New York City courts. Thousands of appeals went unperfected because there weren't enough lawyers to handle them. OAD therefore became New York City's second institutional defense provider. Our mandate was and is straightforward, to represent poor people convicted of felonies on direct appeal. But we married that baseline obligation with an ambitious and visionary mission, to provide outstanding client-centered representation, to improve the quality of indigent defense in New York City, and to pioneer innovative responses to emerging criminal justice trends. Three decades later, OAD is a national leader in the field of indigent appellate defense, and we fulfilled all three of our aspirations. First, we provide exceptional representation. Since last year's first Monday, dozens of OAD clients have had their convictions vacated or their sentences reduced. One of those clients, Mr. Van Dyke Perry, is here with us tonight. Can you stand, Mr. Perry? Stay standing, I'm not done. <laughs> in 1991, when Mr. Perry was just 21 years old, he was accused of a horrific rape. A year later, he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to seven to 14 years in state prison. OAD represented Mr. Perry on direct appeal, but our challenges to his conviction and sentence were unfortunately denied. But our advocacy for Mr. Perry did not end there. A few years ago, we partnered with the Innocence Project, who represents Mr. Perry's co-defendant, to reinvestigate the case. This year, after the New York County District Attorney's Office joined in the reinvestigation process, the complainant admitted that her claim of rape was completely <coughs> false. So on May 7th of 2018, Mr. Perry walked back into 100 Center Street for the first time since the day he was sentenced to state prison. And on that day, he was exonerated. So Mr. So Mr. Perry is a powerful living witness to the outstanding quality of OAD's representation. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Sit. Second, through our institutional commitment to training, OAD has significantly improved the quality of indigent defense representation in New York City and across the country. Because OAD staff attorneys serve for only three years, because OAD maintains a criminal appellate defender clinic here at NYU Law School, and because OAD works with numerous associates at law firms across New York City through its volunteer appellate defender program, OAD attorneys now play significant roles in the administration of criminal justice. This year, we created our first ever OAD alumni directory, a powerful database that demonstrates that our colleagues are now serving as chief state and federal defenders, law professors, philanthropists, law firm partners, authors, and even prosecutors. And third, we have played a consistent role, an important role, as pioneers in the field of indigent defense. We were the first appellate defender to incorporate social work services into our practice. Today, the Client Services Program offers on-site expertise, assistance, and referrals in the areas of ment mental health, medical, substance abuse, housing, employment, public assistance benefits, and educational services. We created a reinvestigation project to immediately review all of our cases for the hallmarks of wrongful conviction and file prompt petitions for relief when appropriate. And Mr. Perry is a living witness to how well that works. There is no doubt that it has been an exceptional 30 years for OAD. But our mission is as urgent today as it was when we first opened our doors. Today, we represent people who are unable to stay engaged with their appeals because they are released from prisons to homeless shelters, and they have to prioritize day-to-day -day survival over case strategy. Today, we represent people whose ability to remain in this country hinges on the outcome of our appeals. 
Today, we represent people who are held, held in prison past their conditional release dates, past their minimum release dates, and even past their maximum release dates because the residency restrictions New York City imposes on people convicted of sex offenses not only prevent our clients from securing housing, they also serve as a banishment, notwithstanding the fact that the United States Department of Justice has determined that such regulations aggravate rather than mitigate offender risk. So we still provide outstanding, we still need to provide outstanding individual representation. We still need to raise the bar on indigent defense. And now more than ever, we must develop creative responses to the constantly emerging criminal justice crises. For all of these reasons, we are incredibly grateful for your ongoing support and we look forward to another outstanding 30 years. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the stars of OAD's 25th annual First Monday Gala and Mock Supreme Court argument. Our advocates and recipients of the Gould Award for Outstanding Advocacy are Lisa Blatt of Arnold and Porter K. Scholler and Don Verrilli of Munger Tolls and Olson. Our Chief Justice and recipient of the OAD Council for Justice Award is Teresa Wynne Roseborough, Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary of the Home Depot. Our mock Supreme Court Justices, all of whom are previous Gould Award recipients are Evan Chesler, Caitlin Halligan, Jay Johnson, Andrew Lavander, Bettina Plevin, Samuel Seymour, Alan Weingrad, and Mary Jo White. Our inaugural Beacon of Hope Award recipient is Khalil Cumberbatch, and our inaugural Gideon Award recipient is Wild Gotchel and Mangies. I want to personally thank all of you for participating in this evening's event and for supporting the important work of OAD. I also want to thank my extraordinary colleagues who, who are some of the smartest, funniest, most compassionate, and hardest working people that I know. I want to thank Michael Keston and Appeal Tech, who literally outdid themselves with this year's First Monday Journals. I want to thank NYU Law School for this beautiful space. I want to thank always our honorary First Monday co-chairs, Roy Reardon and Myrna Felder. Our First Monday host committee, Nick Burton, Angela Burgess, Sean Hecker, Lauren Moskowitz, and Jeff Udell. I want to thank the entire OAD Board of Directors and all of our generous supporters. So tonight, we're also dispensing with tradition and presenting awards both before and after the argument. I have the honor of presenting OAD's newest awards, the Gideon Award and the Beacon of Hope Award before the mock Supreme Court <coughs> argument. And Josh Rosencrantz, OAD's founder and first president and attorney in charge, who, by the way, argued a case before eight justices in another Supreme Court this morning, will present the Gould Awards and the OAD Council for Justice Award immediately after the mock Supreme Court argument. And without further ado, I am proud to present OAD's inaugural Beacon of Hope Award to Khalil Cumberbatch. This award celebrates a former OAD client whose life stands as a powerful example of the human capacity for resilience and highlights the importance of centering the administration of criminal justice around the inherent potential of every person. Fifteen years ago, when he was 21 years old, Khalil was convicted of first-degree robbery. Even though he accepted responsibility for this first-time offense, Khalil was sentenced to 11 years in prison, and he was sent to a maximum security prison. Once there, Khalil realized that he had to figure out how he was going to do all of that time. And what he ultimately did was make two commitments to himself. First, he promised that he would never return to prison. And second, he decided to recreate his legacy so that when his children told the story of their father, it would be that he had made some bad decisions but he also made many good ones, and that the good ones outweighed the bad. These goals became the framework around which Khalil did his time. And fortunately for Khalil, OAD supervising attorney Margaret Knight successfully challenged the constitutionality of his plea and wound up getting his sentence reduced from 11 years to eight years. So while he was in prison, Khalil took college classes. He committed himself to all of the programming that the prison had to offer. 
He doubled down on the commitments he made to himself and his family after he was released. He got a job at the Brooklyn AIDS Task Force within 90 days of his return home. He enrolled in college. He graduated after two years. He pursued a master's in social work. He worked helping people with criminal records go to college. And ultimately, Khalil joined the staff of the Fortune Society, where he now serves as the Associate Vice President of Policy. By keeping those commitments to himself, Khalil has shown his children and the world that a violent felony conviction is not and cannot be an indelible basis for exclusion from society. By keeping those commitments to himself, Khalil has become a beacon of hope, not only for the people behind the prison walls who are trying to figure out how to do their time, but also for the people outside of the prison walls who are trying to figure out how to undo, survive, or help someone else doing time. Please join me in congratulate, congratulating Khalil Khan. the light to hit it just right. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening and um, I was standing here and you hear someone telling portions of your life um, and you can't help but to wonder is that, is that did that really happen to me? Um, so thank you Office of Appellate Defender um, for honoring me with this award. I'm very humbled to accept and to stand here tonight and to say that I would not literally be standing here if it were not for the Office of Appellate Defender. When I first met Margaret Knight, I was in a maximum security prison as, as was mentioned prior to me coming up here. And I remember engaging in a conversation with her at a very sensitive time in my life, to say, to, to say the least. And one of the questions that I always remember asking her was why did you choose criminal law? She was less than two years or three years out of law school. She was just assigned at OAD or landed a job there. And I had to know like this person who I was gonna be engaging with to help fight for my freedom, why did you choose criminal law? And her response was something along the lines of, I wholeheartedly and deeply believe that the criminal justice system doesn't always delve out justice. And I'm here to help fight for that. Now, as someone who had just been sentenced to serve 11 years in prison, I needed to hear that. That was my beacon of hope. And I would argue and say that me hearing that at the beginning of me serving my sentence helped to guide me. It helped to give me something to hold on to, some form of hope to hold on to during very tough and very dark times of my life. And so tonight, I'm here to say that OAD, Margaret Knight, and the amazing staff at OAD were my beacon of hope. And so I hope that everyone here will join me in thanking them for the work that they do, because quite literally they have changed my life and changed the, life, the lives of my family. The last thing I will say is that I am not exceptional. I hope that folks don't look at me as exceptional. I refuse to accept that moniker. I believe wholeheartedly that I am the product of exceptional opportunities. I wholeheartedly believe that if we give more people access to exceptional opportunities, especially in the criminal legal system, despite the type of conviction that they have, I wholeheartedly believe that there will be more Khalils. There will be more outcomes just like mine. There will be more lives changed, more families changed, more communities changed. I urge all of us to think about how exceptionalism is, in some cases, more damaging to criminal legal reform than any form of policy that we can think of. Because the moment that we exceptionalize someone, we somehow create a false standard for everyone else to fight to achieve. And all that it does is exclude people who quite honestly are deserving of those exceptional opportunities. So with that said, thank you OAD, thank you Margaret Knight, wherever you are in this audience, um, and thank you all for listening to me.
Uh, our next honoree is, the next award I'm going to present is our inaugural Gideon Award. And that recipient is Weil, Gotchel, and Mangies. Weil has been a member of OAD's Volunteer Appellate Defender Program for over 10 years. In that time, Weil Associates have briefed and argued upwards of 30 felony appeals before New York's appellate courts. As you know, all of our cases present challenges, difficult facts, legal complexities, demanding clients. But Weil's Associates have invariably risen to the occasion, working incredibly hard, approaching each case with creativity and humanity. I know this because Cami Lizarraga worked at Weil before she became an OAD staff attorney. And while she was there, she participated in the Volunteer Appellate Defender Program. Cami's experience at Weil is emblematic. Cami's case was unexpectedly complicated. The litigation extended over two years and involved three rounds of briefing and oral argument. Although this was far more than she or Weil had bargained for, Cammie was encouraged to remain with the case to the end. Weil supported her throughout. Their paralegals helped her with her filing. Other Weil associates that had participated in our VAD program advised her. And when her appellate division argument was scheduled for the same day as an expert deposition in which she was assisting a Weil partner, that partner handled the deposition on his own and sent Cammie to present her oral argument. Put simply, Weil's commitment to the representation of poor people convicted of felonies is real and substantial. It has changed lives, and we are incredibly grateful to them for, the, for their partnership in this incredibly important work. Please join me in congratulating Weil, Gotchel, and Mangis for their service. Stephen Rice, a partner and co-chair of Weil's Pro Bono Committee, will accept the award on Weil's behalf. I have the easy job. Khalil, you had the really hard job, really. And I admire folks like you um, and folks like the Exonerees, the Innocence Project, more than I can actually say. I must say, looking at this bench, it is hard to imagine a smarter, better, tougher bench. So all I can say to Don and Lisa is, good luck. <laughs> Um, you know, when I think of organizations who are dedicated to the public good and improving the criminal justice system, I think of three things by which I think it's all fair to judge them. One is what's their mission. The second is how do they go about accomplishing their mission. And the third is are they successful? How successful are they in their mission? Well, the OAD mission put simply, is to provide the best quality representation to those who far too often don't get it. And there is no more important or noble mission in the criminal justice system, and Van Dyke Perry is testament to that, as is Letitia Johnson, another person who wrongfully convicted who the OAD was successful in getting exonerated in 2014. Now, that is part of the investigation project, which I believe the OAD started in 2006, which is dedicated to finding those who were wrongfully convicted. You know, my own personal view is there is no imp more important mission for the criminal justice system, and they do a good job at it. Now, when you ask how does the OAD go about accomplishing its mission, it works with law students here at NYU, it works with associates and young lawyers as part of the Appellate Defender Program. And as Weil has had more than 30 young lawyers participate, and as a firm, we've invested in excess, just over the last 12 years, of 10,000 hours in these appeals, all to very good effect. But the result of that is that young lawyers get the best possible mentoring the best possible training on what it really means to be an advocate and what it really means to be an advocate in the most important cases. The cases that keep 
the criminal justice system honest. That's what's critical. And when you ask how successful is the OAD in its mission, the answer is they, because of the quality of their work and the extraordinary results they achieve, not only benefit those they represent, and my understanding is they are successful in achieving relief in in excess of 15 percent of the cases they handle and those of you who do criminal work and criminal appellate work know that is an extraordinary rate but they are most importantly most importantly successful in keeping the system honest and that's the most important goal on behalf of the firm I thank you for this award Okay, so now on to the case. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the case you're going to hear an argument on this evening. Madison versus Alabama tests the boundaries of the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishments. Although today, the death penalty remains a punishment tolerated by the Constitution, the execution of the insane is categorically prohibited. In two decisions, Ford versus Wainwright and Panetti versus Quarterman, the Supreme Court made clear that there are significant questions about, quote, the retributive value of executing a person who has no comprehension of why he has been singled out and stripped of his fundamental right to life, close quote. Vernon Madison relies on this well-established precedent to assert that he, too, is ineligible for execution. However, Mr. Madison is not insane within the common law definition of the word. Instead, Mr. Madison has suffered a series of strokes that have left him with a variety of cognitive impairments, including an inability to remember the crime that sent him to death row. Mr. Madison asserts that this condition renders him as incompetent to be executed as a traditionally insane person. Thus, the question before the court is whether the Eighth Amendment prohibits the execution of a prisoner who has no memory of the offense for which he has been condemned to death. Here are the facts. Vernon Madison was tried, convicted of capital murder, and sentenced to death three times for the 1985 shooting of a police officer in Alabama. After his third conviction and death sentence were affirmed by the state and federal courts, Mr. Madison suffered two strokes that he claims left him with a variety of physical and mental impairments, including an inability to, rem to remember the crime. After the state of Alabama scheduled his execution, Mr. Madison's counsel, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative of Alabama, filed a petition in state court claiming that Mr. Madison was incompetent to be executed. The state court held a hearing on that claim in which both Mr. Madison and the state of Alabama presented expert witnesses. Both experts testified that Mr. Madison is neither delusional nor psychotic. Both experts testified that Mr. Madison's cognitive functioning declined as a result of the strokes that he suffered. But the, the court-appointed expert concluded that Mr. Madison has a rational understanding of his sentence and knows that he is to be executed for the killing of a police officer. That expert also found that Mr. Madison remembers a lot of other information from a long time ago. Mr. Madison's expert concluded that he understands the meaning of a death sentence, what he was tried for, and the state's desire for retribution. However, Mr. Madison expert found that he cannot remember the name of the victim or the sequence of events from the offense to the arrest and trial. He testified that Mr. Madison does not understand the act for which he is being punished. The state court credited the state's expert and concluded that Mr. Madison was competent to be executed. Mr. Madison filed a habeas, federal habeas petition challenging the state's court decision. The 11th Circuit reversed the state court holding, and I'll quote them, a finding that a man with no memory of what he did wrong has a rational understanding of why he is being put to death is patently unreasonable. The Supreme Court reversed the 11th Circuit, noting that it has never held that an inability to remember the crime renders a person incompetent to be executed. Mr. Madison filed a second petition challenging his competency in state court. In that petition, he relied on his prior evidence, plus the fact that the court-appointed expert was arrested charged with unlawful possession of controlled substances 
and suspended from the practice of psychology not long after he testified in Mr. Madison's first competency hearing. Alabama argued that Mr. Madison's evidence was not new and that the expert's legal problems did not undermine the methodology he used to evaluate Mr. Madison. The state court denied Mr. Madison's petition. He sought review in the Supreme Court, which was granted, and the cert petition was granted. Okay, a bit of logistical information before we begin. First, there is no intermission. Immediately after the argument, Josh Rosencrantz will present the Gould Awards for Outstanding Oral Advocacy and the OAD Council for Justice Award, and then we will observe the deliberations of the mock Supreme Court. We will be done by 9.15. Please silence your phones. And join me now in the courtroom of the mock Supreme Court of the United States as I invite our court crier, Myrna Felder, to open up our court session. The time is 10 a.m. The day is the first Monday in October 2018. Please rise. The justices of the mock Supreme Court of the United States. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the mock Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give your attention because the court is now sitting. God bless the United States and this honorable court. The court will hear argument in case 17-7505, Madison versus Alabama. Mr. Verrilli, we will hear from you first. Madam Chief Justice, Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> and may it please the court. The execution of Vernon Madison in his current state of incapacitation would be the very definition of cruel and unusual punishment. It would deny Madison the respect for human dignity that the Eighth Amendment guarantees to every individual, including those facing death, and it would make a mockery of the societal commitment to human dignity that the Eighth Amendment exists to embody and sustain. Now, if I could just take a minute at the outset to focus on the key facts before moving into the argument. Mr. Madison's incapacitation is not the kind of normal, fuzzy thinking, foggy headedness, inability to recall critical detail and occasional incontinence that the members of this esteemed court are all too familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> and I must say, and I must say, Try to get on our good with side. distressing frequency on the bench. <laughs> Something I've always wanted to say, by the way. <laughs> now, turning Mr. to Mr. Verrilli, are you prepared to argue directly that the loss of memory alone is sufficient to render it cruel and unusual punishment to execute Mr. Madison? Or is your argument contingent on a broader finding that he has lost not only his memory, but his understanding of the connection between his conduct and the events leading to his execution. So our argument is directly tied, Your Honor, to his condition of vascular dementia. And I think it's important to go through that. Now, he's had multiple strokes. He's legally blind. He cannot walk without assistance. Even uh, So your argument is not based on the lack of memory alone? No, of course it's a critical piece of it, but it's embedded in that context. Now, in, in terms of understanding, you understand... Does there have to be a medical condition? Well, I think what it needs to be, Your Honor, is uh, <coughs> with, with respect to dementia itself, without, we, we can discuss other medical conditions, but when you're talking about vascular dementia and the particular symptoms, the particular manifestations of vascular dementia and its effects, that certainly creates the kind of mental incapacity that puts a person like Mr. Madison in exactly the same kind of position as the defendant in Panetti and the defendant in Ford. And that's Mr. Wait a Barilla, you're not claiming uh, that Mr. Madison was insane uh, under that rubric. And nor was it, is it necessary to? No, correct? it's not necessary to. Is, exactly is a medical diagnosis necessary? So I, I think a medical diagnosis uh, would certainly be a powerful evidence in a case like this, and you have a medical diagnosis here. And in fact, if there are any doubt here about this, you know, I understand my, my friend from the state of Alabama has argued and will argue to you, look, this is gonna create all kinds of opportunities for malingering. 
but let's get real. You cannot fake an MRI. And vascular dementia can be detected by those kinds of neuro scans like MRI. But counsel, the MRI can't determine whether the, whether the petitioner has actually lost his memory of the events, can it? No, it can't, but it's powerful corroborating evidence, in particular when you've got all of the other sorts of symptoms that you see from uh, Mr. Madison here. <clears throat> Remember, the, the, this fact, I think, is just absolutely striking about Mr. Madison that the, I think belies any suggestion that he could possibly be a malinger. In addition to all the other things I said, this is a man who regularly soils himself despite living in a cell with a toilet right there a few feet but away because he really doesn't realize that the toilet is there. I'm not sure that we can even consider all of those additional facts. When you asked this court to grant certiorari in this case, you presented two questions to this court, and I'm not sure, Mr. Verrilli, if you have ever read the Supreme Court rules of practice or if you're familiar with them, um, <laughs> but I believe that it's the practice of this court that when we grant on a particular question, that's the sum total of what's before this court. Now, much to my surprise, you have amended your questions presented in your merits brief and significantly broadened what you have now put before the court, including anything beyond the loss of memory. So how can we even consider all of these additional circumstances? Well, Your Honor, you know there are rules and there are rules. <laughs> and as this court well knows, uh, there's some flexibility with respect to the court's understanding of the question presented and even the ability to, uh, to amend the question presented in a way that captures the true issue in the case. And of course, the facts that I'm talking about here really are facts that provide the context for and substantiate the legal issue. And I do think the key point here is that whether it's psychosis, whether it's some other kind of delusional condition, or whether it's dementia that prevents you from being able to understand the connection between the, the fact that you're going to be put to death and the reason that you're going to be put to death, you are in the land that this court has identified as cruel and unusual Mr. punishment. Mr. Burley, do I understand the facts correctly that your client understands that he's been convicted of murder of a police officer. He understands that a death penalty is the sentence that's been imposed. And he claims, based on evidence, that he cannot remember the events in question. Is that the, that's the facts, right? Essentially, yes. Okay. And Mr. Would, no. your, would, your, would your answer or your position in this court be different if he could remember beating his girlfriend but just couldn't remember the shooting of the police officer? Uh, you know, I don't know what the answer to that would be, but on the facts here, I think the key thing is, like, this is no different. The, the level of understanding he has here is no different than if the state of Alabama came to him and said, look, Mr. Madison, we're going to execute you. And the reason we're going to execute you is to propitiate the Mayan rain god Chaka, because we need a good cotton crop this year. Now, Mr. Madison would understand that he's going to be executed, and he'd understand the reason that the state gave for the execution. But that doesn't mean he's in the position, as the, as the court said in Panetti, to not just understand, the, to not just understand the, the statements given by the, the state to him, but to be able to appreciate the moral gravity of the situation, to come to terms with it morally, and be able to make his peace with his maker. He's in exactly the same position, exactly the same position as Mr. Ford was and Mr. Panetti was. And for that reason, he's got exactly the same rights under the so, so are, are you so saying, I'm sorry, are you saying that we, that we uh, don't have to expand the law to agree with you that, that uh, the prior holdings are sufficient? Are you asking us to expand Ford and Panetti and go beyond them? Or do you really believe that a, 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 a defendant like this who is not insane uh, gets the benefit of the arguments We're you're making. We're asking you to apply Ford and Panetti to a new set of factual circumstances where the principles of Ford and Panetti apply with equally strong force as they did in Ford and Panetti. Because just as in Ford and Panetti, Mr. Madison is not able to come to terms with the fact that the state is going to execute him and to make his peace with his maker, and society equally is in a position where the retributive function of punishment cannot be carried out effectively because of his mental state. When you say he can't come to terms, is that because he doesn't remember having committed the capital offense? Well, I think... Or is, it more, or is there more to it than that? I think that uh, the basic idea is not that... Uh, I would phrase it a little differently, Your Honor. It's not that he... Your, your uh, phrase. Can, okay. That he can't... That he, it's not that he can't, under, that he can't remember the facts of the murder. It's that he can't remember being a participant in a murder. He can't remember that as a life experience, and therefore he can't possibly 
connect up that, that uh, aspect of, the, of uh, this situation to what's about to happen to him. That's exactly But he the does same. know he's been convicted of that crime. Right. But, yes, Your Honor, but of course in, in Panetti, there were three things that were true. The defendant knew in Panetti that he was convicted uh, of the crime. The defendant remembered committing the crime in Panetti, and the defendant knew that the reason the state was going to execute him was because he had committed the crime. And here, you, the, one of the three key facts that the Supreme Court and Panetti said weren't sufficient is completely absent. You have, with Mr. Madison, you don't have the memory of the crime. And therefore, it seems to me, although it's a new situation, it's not exactly the same scenario that existed in Ford or in Panetti. It almost follows a fortiori from Panetti because, as I said, Mr. Panetti remembered the facts. And, it even, and there, the court said it wasn't sufficient. Mr. So, can I, please. Madam Chief Justice, can I ask a question, please? Yes, Thank Justice you. Johnson. Okay. Um, Mr. Varelli, let me ask you a hypothetical question. We appellate judges love hypothetical questions. Yeah, I know so that. So let's, <laughs> let's cut to the chase here. Hypothetically, let's stipulate that the defendant has no recollection of the events that led to his conviction, okay? By all accounts, he can't remember a thing. But when the events that led to his conviction were explained to him by a person he trusted and he said well if I was convicted by a jury of my peers for that offense and I did what you say I did I deserve to die would you concede with me that in that circumstance the death penalty would be possible I'd concede that that would be a harder case than this case um, and, you would concede and, with my hypothetical, though, right? Uh, no, I would concede it would be a harder case. That's all I'm willing to concede, Your Honor. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is that uh, you know, it, it, it's a little, it just seems to me a little bit hard that if, if we're talking, after all, about a murder. You can't be, uh, you can't be uh, sentenced to death unless you've committed a murder. The idea that someone could be in that situation seems to me to be a bit of a stretch, that this is a person otherwise completely of sound mind, just can't remember the fact that he committed a murder, but once he commits it, he, he, once he's told he committed it, he, he says, okay, I deserve to be murdered. But whatever you, however you uh, analyze that situation, in this situation, you've got a person who, even according to the state's experts, suffers from extraordinarily strong cognitive disabilities, very serious memory loss. This is a person who can't walk, who can't see, who basically can't maintain himself in any serious way. And, the, and therefore, when you, when you consider the fact that he has no memory in the context of that set of facts and a diagnosis of dementia, you've got, uh, you've got seems to me, very strong grounds for concluding. Well, would you agree with me that someone suffering from dementia can be self-aware that they are suffering from memory loss. Yes, uh, uh, for a time, yes. Are evolving standards of decency relevant to our Eighth Amendment analysis, counsel? So I think this case actually is, this set of circumstances actually easier from the evolving standards of decency. But, but is that a relevant factor for us to consider in deciding whether or not what you posit violates the Eighth Amendment or not? Well, it, it is, of course, has been for many decades. All right, and so court. how do we factor in the fact that not a single state in our country has <coughs> taken the position that you are taking, even in legislation? That is to say, no state has prohibited capital punishment for prisoners with dementia-induced memory loss. How do we take that into, in, into account? Well, I think actually you've got to go to the more basic principle, and, this, and that's why I think in terms of evolving standards of decency. This has been the standard of decency for 400 years. Go back to Cook. Cook specifically said 400 years ago that it, it, it is, it, it was Cook's words, that it was cruel and inhumane to execute a person in this situation. It is exactly what Blackstone said. It had to have been within the contemplation of the framers. So how do you well, explain that, that, that 50 states have not seen fit to do what you are suggesting? Well, you know, I, I'm not aware that before this case that, that, that the issue has ever arisen that somebody has come before a court and said, my client has, uh, my client is afflicted with dementia and cannot, and, and has no memory of the facts 
that lead that that, that are supporting the, uh, the the conviction here. That's just something I think that has never arisen, and I think that would thoroughly explain why there isn't specific statutes. But whatever the statutes may say or not say, as I said, well, the the court has said in Ford and has said in Panetta very clearly that if a defendant is in a situation where, as a result of a mental disability, the defendant cannot understand the moral connection between what the state wants to do to him and, and what he did before. Counsel, what, is, what does that have to do with the, with the issue of deterrence, though? If I'm out there planning a crime, what is the fact that your client can't recall the events going to have to do with the deterrent effect upon me, which is one of the arguments you've made? Yeah, so, you know, it, I think that's a harder call, the question of deterrence. You know, I suppose you could find some deterrent effect here. You probably could have even more deterrent effect if you tied him up and burned him at the stake, but that would still be cruel and unusual punishment even though it would have a deterrent effect. And I think that this issue of whether the, there could be a deterrent effect even though the defendant will lack all capacity and understanding uh, for why the defendant is being executed. No, he, he, he understands that he's Thank been convicted you. of murder. So I have one last question if I might. But let's, let's hold that for his okay, rebuttal. rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Varelli. We'll, we'll now, Your Honor, if I might. <laughs> <laughs> we'll now hear from uh, Ms. Blatt. Uh, Ms. Blatt, before you start talking, um, I need to make a disclosure. Mr. Borelli, when he was Solicitor General, represented me when I was a cabinet officer. You don't have a, you don't have a problem with that, do you? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. He, he lost the case. It wasn't my fault. He and lost I'll the represent case. you if you ever get into trouble. <laughs> right. Thank you. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The decision below should be affirmed for two reasons. First, amnesia should not bar the death penalty of someone otherwise fully competent to be executed. And second, this court's prior decision already forecloses petitioner's separate and fact-bound contention that he is incompetent to be executed in this case. As to our first contention, a defendant's lack of independent recollection of the crime does not lessen his ability to understand the gravity of murder or share the community's understanding of crime and punishment. His memory of the crime is no different from the victim's family and the rest of society. All that matters under the Eighth Amendment is whether the defendant is otherwise mentally competent at the time of execution. A mentally competent defendant who claims he can't remember a crime is not meaningfully different from a defendant on death row who goes to the gas chamber claiming he's absolutely innocent or that the killing was justified by self-defense. You don't dispute that he doesn't have any memory as a matter of fact. This court should be bound by the fact that he has absolutely. no memory and of the crime in question. Absolutely, and that's why the first question presented is a pure legal issue that a defendant who's an amnesiac who has no memory of the murder, whether that alone forecloses the death penalty. and. As was earlier mentioned, no state, no state legislature has seen fit to do that, and no court has ever held that it is a defense uh, to the death penalty or any other crime until the 11th Circuit decision. But, but, but counsel, case. your analogy to a defendant who, who claims to be innocent, doesn't that, doesn't that just swallow the rule? Every defendant who would claim that he or she is innocent would then, according to the logic of that analysis, be immune from execution. Isn't it different? If, if a defendant actually has no memory of the crime of, of which he stands com, uh, 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 convicted, and therefore the question is whether he can truly appreciate that he's being executed for something that he has no memory of, of ever having done? Of course he can appreciate it. Their position, and if you vote the other way, applies to a nuclear physicist who has confessed to the crime to his priest, the police, and the public, and can watch a video of himself not only confessing but committing the murder. Now, this case isn't far off. The defendant was the, um, excuse me, the petitioner was the only person at the scene who was not shot in the back. But we so, thought I mean, you were not, who else could have committed the crime here? We thought you were not contesting whether or not he can't remember the crime. So why don't we take that for granted? And here's Absolutely, what I, we concede that he has amnesia of the crime. Okay, okay. So here's what I would like to understand. If you, if you look at Ford and Panetti, it seems to me they say that a prisoner has to be able to come to grips with his conscience and his God before he's executed. So if he can't recall the conduct, how can he engage in that exercise? And a defendant who thinks he's innocent can't engage it either. Now, here's the critical difference. Well, that defendant might be delusional, Ms. Black. Oh, a lot of people get executed who 
you know, think they're innocent. In fact, most. But let me give you. Um, but does, a, does it matter if it's caused by a medical condition as opposed to just saying I don't remember? <clears throat> Well, Doesn't ultimately, I mean, they're, the other side's position doesn't extend to that, and certainly the question presented isn't. But even if it's a medical condition, I don't know what that means, uh, a medical condition. Well, we that, had psychiatrists and psychologists testifying here, doctors. Right, and it's evidence. ultimately going to boil down to the defendant's testimony. And I don't think the state of medical science is a reliable backdrop for this reason. The DSM-5, which is the, the basis for this yes. uh, mm -hmm. uh, neuro, whatever it's called, disorder, neurocognitive disorder, it <laughs> says that the difference between a major and minor one is inherently arbitrary and there's no precise thresholds. So is there, there any level of impairment from stroke that you would accept as sufficient to invoke Eighth Amendment protections? Absolutely. Our position is quite bright line. If you have dementia and you meet Ford and Panetti, meaning you're incompetent to be executed, you're home free. Well, not home free, but you're you're death free. Mm -hmm. So all he has to show is that he's otherwise incompetent. Now let me just put this. So you can see that it's not necessary that it be mental illness, that physical illness, Alzheimer's, dementia, stroke, all these vascular dementia, all these other conditions that might produce similar lack of cognition would be sufficient. Absolutely. And let's be clear what we think is going on. I mean, when the cert was granted, four of you thought Justice Kennedy was on the court. Now, this case bought the petitioner a lot of time, and if petitioner's mental state is truly faltering, he can file another petition for incompetency and make that showing. But here, there was testimony by the petitioner's own doctor that excluded him from meeting Ford and Panetti. And this court said the uh, court reasonably assessed it and the evidence from petitioner's own doctor supported the finding of competency. So on that fact-bound uh, fact position, petitioner is host. How he is, has how no is, case. How is it relevant in your analysis uh, that the petitioner has vascular dementia? Is it irrelevant to the analysis? It was certainly relevant at, in terms of the fact-bound issue of whether he's competent. It's not relevant to the legal question presented, whether amnesia, because you could have dementia but still remember so, the So you crime. can have someone with amnesia who is incompetent, or you can have someone with amnesia who is not. Right, and you can have, right, and you can have someone with uh, dementia who's both incompetent or not incompetent. I mean, the, the, the reason why the petitioner should lose this case is because his legal position is ridiculous, and what is sympathetic about his case is fact-bound, and he already lost before this court on habeas. And what you should ask petitioner on rebuttal is how this court could find that the finding of fact is clearly erroneous that petitioner is competent, but somehow this court said the evidence supported it and the trial court reasonably assessed the evidence. So he is stuck with the finding that he's competent. And the petitioner has to defend a rule where someone who can teach nuclear physics but can't remember the crime and there's a confession and can watch a video, somehow there's something indecent about that or barbaric about it when there's nothing indecent or barbaric about executing someone. Well, is there something indecent in, in or barbaric about executing somebody when the jury voted eight to four not to convict him, not to sentence him to death? So this court, I mean, divided 4-4 four, four on that issue, and uh, the great state of Alabama saw fit to change that rule. So now we don't have judges doing that. But the two juries before, admittedly, there were bats and violations and some problems with evidence, but the that hasn't stopped the state in the past. The only, pro the only but he proper was jury convicted to twice. consider the right evidence voted 8-4 to four not to, 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 to impose the death penalty. Correct? Right. And if this court wants to decide, I mean, only I, I don't think any state has the judge override issue. But that question's not before you. And again, you only have eight justices, so I don't think you're going to rule against me on that. It seems to me there's, <laughs> seems to me there's another issue that might not be before us, but I keep reading about it throughout your brief, which is um, the individual who, who the defendant here killed. Now, I agree it was a heinous crime, but do you agree with me that the circumstances of the murder have no bearing on the legal question before us about whether his medical condition bars him from execution? I mean, that's fair, um, Justice Howley. And let me just mention on that, I mean, we would have to take the same position if it was his cellmate. But in terms of the police officer, it's more of their position does extend to a murdered police officer. Their posi position would extend to a terrorist. Their position would extend to somebody who killed a As bunch of children. As would any decision under the Eighth Amendment, I would right. expect. I don't think we have exceptions for particular classes exactly. of victims. Exactly. And if he murdered his cellmate or a terrorist, we'd still be here. The state has an independent interest. Uh, for all the reasons we have uh, that this court has held the death penalty is constitutional, and some of you believe it's an inherently good thing, um, that's why uh, it doesn't really matter who the victim is. If the defendant had an IQ of 60, would it be constitutional to execute him? 
I mean, I don't know what the law, I mean, that's Adkins, I think, maybe, but it, it depends yes, on whether he's not got I a think. disability. That's what the case is, counsel. I don't know what he's, his here is like 73, but sure, if there's an independent basis, again, if his condition worsens and he files a petition for incompetency and can show it, including based on a low IQ, then he meets the standard for incompetence so you would can't say be that executed. Even though he cannot remember his conduct, he can't remember committing as the crime. As long as someone can come and explain it to him and say, here's what happened, here's what we believe you did, and for that we have decided to execute you, as long as someone can explain or tell him a story. And he can rationally understand it. If he can't, so let me tell you Even the difference. Even if he cannot, he lacks the ability to accept it as true. Absolutely. Because he cannot remember those events in himself. And the cause of his inability to remember is a condition that will not relent. It is a physical documented condition that will continue to plague him and his thought process. Right. So that he has no ability, or we, we have no reason to believe that he will acquire any ability to link that story he's told to himself. So, but the state maintains an interest in executing him under those circumstances. A defendant who's competent, by definition, means he rationally understands that society thinks that murdering people uh, is wrong and that the society likes to execute people who are murderers. Now that's no different from a defendant who says, well that's really interesting but I think I'm innocent or I actually did it in self-defense, I'm sorry the jury didn't agree with me. It's, just, it's no different. Let me tell you the difference with Panetti because my friend on the other side said that Mr. Madison is no different. No. And this is why. Mr. Panetti said um, the state could say whatever it wanted. I hear you, this rash, I have a ability, I'm aware that you're saying you wanna execute me because you think I did something. But what I'm telling you, I believe you're executing me because I'm preaching uh, God and I'm preaching you know, being religious. And so he met the threshold and he had no ability for it. For all he could understand is that he was being murdered for being religious. Now this defendant, and by hypothesis in terms of the competency being um, already determined against him, can understand the same as a defendant who saw the video and the same as a defendant who said, I'm innocent. I, I see the video, but I'm telling you I'm innocent. And that happens every day. Defendants claim their innocence or they claim the killing was justified. They claim the witnesses lied or whatever. Counsel, I know it's an counsel. uncomfortable feeling, but that is what we do is execute people in this country. Uh, you your, brief, your brief repeatedly states that uh, if we rule against the state of Alabama in this case, that we will uh, throw deterrence to the, to the wind. And I want to understand whether putting out a notice that you are keeping somebody in jail without parole for the rest of their life, but you're not executing them, because they have no memory of the events and has been medically shown to be that way, that that somehow undermines deterrence in the state of Alabama. So I don't, I mean, with all due respect, we don't have that burden. We have to show it does serve deterrence and it absolutely does. If we'll put you to death, even when you can't remember the crime, you might think twice. Now I have to admit that there- That, that, would, that would be true of people stealing candy also. Yes, yeah, it would, it would which, is why, which is why Mr. Varelli had a hard time when you asked him about deterrence. He didn't have a good answer. There's no question the state wins big time on deterrence. As long as you believe that there is a delta of deterrence between life imprisonment and death penalty. Now there is no deterrence and this is the cook or whatever that old guy's name was on um, 400 years ago, what he's saying is that there's no deterrence if you are not, uh, if you're just completely out of it when you're being executed. Because frankly, if you told me I was gonna be executed, but I won't, ha you know, I'll be, my mind will be gone, I don't care. So that, in that sense, it does not a deterrence. But if you tell me I'm gonna be executed when I'm mentally competent, but you don't remember the crime, I better not engage in criminal conduct. Counsel, can we oh. talk about another um, societal interest in analyzing the Eighth Amendment? I mean, if you look to what Justice Marshall said in Ford versus Rainwright, I mean, one of the considerations in analyzing the issue is obviously to protect the dignity of society itself uh, from the barbarity of exacting mindless vengeance. And so the question is, why doesn't that consideration come into play here to prohibit the state uh, from executing a person with absolutely no memory of the commission of a capital crime for which he's about to be put to death? Because he's otherwise fully competent to understand that murder is a really bad thing and that our country actually kills people who engage in murder. He, it is barbaric 
probably in all of you who are going to vote for petitioner that you would kill someone who claims he's innocent and you probably think the death penalty is barbaric but if you don't if you I think I wouldn't assume anything in a long Okay <laughs> if you think that the death penalty actually carries out legitimate state interest now what I think you're doing though counsel is skipping over the separate societal interest in uh, avoiding involving itself in a barbaric, uh, barbar uh, barbaric uh, execution. It's uh, you're, you're looking at it from the perspective of the innocence, deterrence, other societal uh, interests, but not that one. So no one thinks, and it's not a defense ever, to a crime, amnesia. It has never been a defense. And you could have someone who committed a murder when they were drunk, and they don't have any memory of the crime. It does, there's nothing barbaric by saying to society, if you're otherwise sane and can understand that a jury has validly convicted you, a judge has constitutionally imposed a death penalty, and this is what we do to criminals. Even if you claim you're innocent, even if you claim the killing was justified, even if you claim all the witnesses lied, and even if medical evidence supports a finding that you don't remember the crime. The key is competency right. at the but time of execution. But isn't, aren't we allowed to um, put a new gloss on what competence means? Aren't we allowed to revisit that and flesh it out and, and, and adapt it in, in, in each new case? So you, your position yeah. is this man that's been described is, is competent, right? You believe he's competent. No, this but, court held the evidence was sufficient, but yes, we do believe he's competent. But he's co competent, is that based competent on of what? Dr. what, what Dr. Is he? Kirkland's uh, opinion? And Dr. Goff. This court earlier said that both experts. By the way, are either of them medical doctors or are they both psychologists? I think, doctor, I think they're both psychologists. psychologists. Dr. Kirkland is so no medical degrees. not practicing medicine anymore. He's moved on to better <laughs> well, professions. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't that have an impact here? Well, the, the, again, the problem for the other side is his own doctor did not help him by, by, by confessing to the standard of competency that he could understand that he committed murder and that he, the death penalty but was being imposed for that murder. But as to your question about evolving standards of decency, sure, you could decide, but I don't think you should, that memory of the crime, uh, lack of memory of the crime is the same thing as being mentally uh, incompetent at the time of execution, but that would just be a, a radical extension that no state, no court has ever done, and it would lead to some real problems when, again, this is the DSM-5 says it's inherently arbitrary and there are no precise thresholds. Can you just tell me what he's competent of, what he's competent for? Would you, would you give him a driver's license? Um, probably, I don't know, actually. Would you let him enlist in the military? Definitely. We, we, we've been described. Let me, um, <laughs> we've been we've been told this guy can't walk across the cell, and you. I, I have a feeling you're saying he's competent of one thing, which is to be executed. No, he apparently he remembered the Batson, which was really quite exceptional. He remembered the judicial override Batson. Uh, he spoke specifically about the sentences of life and death. But if you so, this is a fact-bound question. If you want to reopen, competence. I, I, don't, I thought competence and memory weren't the same thing. You know, just uh, a machine that can remember uh, a song, so, that doesn't make it a competent. So let's be competent. clear. This court per curiam signed a decision saying that the evidence supported the fact he was competent. This was after the 2015 and 2016 stroke. This was just a few months ago. If this court always has the discretion to reopen mm -hmm. that and the state concedes if his dementia renders him incompetent, then he wins. And if he can show that in a way that gets upheld on appeal, Ms. Black, can he we wins. talk about, and he, um, help me understand the level of awareness you think we determined was sufficient. Your brief argues that it's the awareness of someone in the community, that the awareness that someone in the community might have. So I might read the newspaper about a crime and have sort of a dissociated observer, spectator awareness of what <laughs> happened. Are you saying that that type of awareness, the awareness that someone might glean from reading the newspaper, is sufficient to make them to, to establish competency to be executed? No. So we, which is why the other side wants to conflate them. We think that if he's incompetent for whatever reason, dementia or anything else, he gets off. But if his only defense is, which is the first question presented, is he can't remember the crime, he is no different than. Um, than anyone else in society in terms of being able to understand that murder is wrong and that the community punishes <coughs> murder and that's why we have the death penalty. So you seem still to be focusing on what he deserves as opposed to the 
comment that my colleague made about what we as society deserve in terms of protection against believing ourselves capable of heinous acts. Sure, so that's a fair point. In terms of retribution, in terms of um, the Eighth Amendment and retribution incorporating a standard of justice and decency, there is something very unjust about someone who has zero cognitive ability and you're gonna inflict the death penalty. It is, it's always been considered unconstitutional and society sees no point in that. But we're talking about hypothesis of, is there a, a situation of an eye for an eye, um, a sense of justice and retribution and the community sense of outrage and venting? Is it okay if the defendant is not, you know, has cognitive ability and can understand, can, can rationally understand that murder is wrong, that he's been convicted, and he rationally understands that there is a connection between this crime of murder and, um, and the ca capital punishment. It, I think what's built into the- Thank, thank you, you, Ms. Blatt. You're welcome. Mr. Verrilli, you have five minutes for a rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I have four points I'd like to make on rebuttal. Mr. Verrilli, before you make those points, would you answer a question? If a defendant is so drunk when he commits a crime that he can't remember it, can he be executed for it if he's otherwise eligible for execution? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, maybe uh, you could help us out and, and try to come and, up but with I a think response. However, well, uh, here's my response. However the court would decide that question, uh, you could decide this question in our favor and decide that question either way, it seems to me. And what you need to do is decide the question that's before you. And what I'd like to do Can be before you go then, let me ask the question the I wanted to ask The first question before. that you put before us or the second question that you put before Both. us? <laughs> Which one? Both. So, so the question I, I, I wanted to ask before is, you keep talking about that he's blind and he can't, you know, he's got no motor abilities and so on and so forth. But you would agree that if there was a blind, wheelchair-bound prelate who advocated and planned uh, the destruction of Americans in mass numbers as a terrorist, that the fact that they were blind and couldn't motor uh, themselves would be irrelevant, correct? Uh, it would depend on what claim that the that to the eighth, to the eighth, to the Eighth Amendment. Well, if the if the depend on what claim that prelate was making, might well be irrelevant. What, but the reason and, and so so that your argument is really focused on the issue of memory, and you've tried to expand it. But the fact that he's now blind and the fact that he has motor skill problems is irrelevant to our analysis. I, respect, I respectfully disagree with that, Your Honor. It's quite relevant because it's all very strongly corroborating evidence of the dementia. And therefore, the, the, the government has relevant. conceded, the state of Alabama has conceded that your, your client doesn't remember the facts. So you don't need to corroborate any further. The question is whether that lack of memory alone is a basis for us to expand the Ford test. Well, respectfully, I would suggest that the question is whether the circumstances that he presents to you can be materially distinguished from the principles that were applied in Ford and Panetti, and they can't. Now, if I could just make, I have four points I'd like to make. And the first one uh, is that my friend, Ms. Blatt, has asked you to ask me a question. The question she's asked you to ask me is, uh, how do I get around the factual findings in the state court? Here's how. The state court applied the wrong legal standard. This is exactly the same as Panetti, exactly the same. And if you, you can look at page 956 of Panetti and see it. In Panetti, the state court found that the condemned person was aware he committed murder, was aware he would be executed, and was aware that the reason the state would carry out the execution was because of the murder, and therefore was competent as a matter of law. That is exactly what Alabama did here, minus the fact that the defendant was aware that he had actually committed the murder. And what the court held was that that test was too restrictive as a matter of law. And the reason the court said that in Panetti was because the principles set forth in Ford are put at risk by a rule that deems delusions relevant only with respect to the state's announced reason for punishment or the facts of an imminent execution, as opposed to the real interest the state seeks to vindicate. That's the whole point. You used a word in your case. answer, delusions. Uh, the, you don't have any evidence of that in this case. No, but what we have is something that produces the same inability to come to grips with the moral gravity of the situation. But unlike the delusional situation, counsel, he can, as your adversary pointed out, be reminded of the facts he's forgotten. He's uh, able to link that to the punishment. If he were delusional, nobody telling him what happened would cure that problem. Isn't that a fundamental difference between the two situations? It's, not, it, it's a difference, but not a material difference, Your Honor, because the question is whether he can come to grips with the real interest the state seeks to vindicate. 
And, that, and, and if you can't even bring to mind the facts that are going to lead to the extinguishment of your life, you cannot do that. Now, a couple more points. With respect to the argument about deterrence, just want to wrap that up. That exact argument was made and rejected in Ford, and that exact argument was made and rejected in Panetta, and it should be rejected as it was here as well. Uh, and then, uh, final point, if I could. I just ask the court to take a step back. Your Honor has suggested that that set of facts and circumstances is legally irrelevant, but it isn't. Think about what we're talking about here. We're talking about executing that person that Your Honor described in your questions and that I described earlier. A person who can't see, can't walk, soils himself routinely, can't remember this crime, can't remember all kinds of things, thinks his mother's still alive, thinks he's going to leave prison and go live in Florida. The state of Alabama wants to take that man out and make an example of him by executing him. That is exactly what has been cruel and unusual punishment for 400 years. How do you reliably distinguish between somebody who genuinely has all those characteristics and someone who's just either faking or malingering? Hasn't this court pointed out sort of the danger of, of resting a constitutional principle on that basis? May I answer? You may answer. Thank you. So, the, these, these kinds of issues come up so infrequently that they don't pose any systemic risk to the system. When they come up, they are adjudicated on the facts, just like any other set of issues. And as I said, this particular set of issues, particularly when you're focusing on... Briefly. On, on, <laughs> I'm trying, Your Honor. On dementia. <coughs> that is something you can find with an MRI. This is, this is easier than most cases, and for that reason, we think there's no doubt that there's an Eighth Amendment violation here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Verrilli. The case is submitted. Please rise. The mock Supreme Court of the United States now stands adjourned. The court will reconvene on Monday, October 7, at 10 a.m. Set of honor uh, of uh, awards for tonight's honorees. I'll start with Don Verilli. I am pleased to say that I've known Don Verilli in wearing many, many hats in my life. He was, he's been a co counsel, he's been an adversary, uh, he's been an advisor, he's been a role model, he's been a friend. And he's been a gem in every single one of those roles. I will never forget the time that I first met Don. I'm sure, Don, you couldn't possibly remember this. But I was clerking for Justice Brennan, and Don was visiting for lunch. It was 30 years ago. I was 12. <laughs> Don was 60. <laughs> He's a pretty well-preserved 91, I think. So, so he wasn't really 60, but he had the bearing and the gravitas and the elegance of a man, even back then, far beyond his years. As Don left, this is what I remember most vividly, Justice Brennan said to me, keep an eye on that man. He's going to go places. <laughs> So I did, and he did. Um, in private practice, Don was the go-to lawyer for telecom, for First Amendment cases, at all levels of the, of the judiciary, including the Supreme Court. He surprised a lot of people when 20 years into practice, he left private practice to join the Obama administration uh, as Associate Deputy Attorney General. Frankly, it didn't surprise me. Don has had public service in his DNA, in his blood, for his entire life. I was also not surprised when with each passing turn in the administration, he was recognized and promoted to various different levels, ultimately to uh, Solicitor General. As one former administration official recounted, it was his judgment his character, his talent, and personal warmth that were recognized wherever he went. 
In the limited time I have, I couldn't possibly do justice to the dozens of cases that Don has argued and how he's distinguished himself. Many of them were supremely consequential, like his brilliant defense of the Affordable Care Act, uh, his blow for marriage equality in, o in Obergefell and Windsor, and his vindication of federal immigration authority in Arizona versus the United States. I could go on for quite some time on his various professional uh, accomplishments, but I'd like to spend a moment just talking about some personal attributes. I put together a brain trust of a large number of Supreme Court practitioners, including every living former Solicitor General who's currently practicing, uh, a whole bunch of deputy SGs, and I asked them about both Don and Lisa. And I have a lot of dirt. <laughs> For Don, the description that rose to the top of the list were two. Brilliant and passionate. First, brilliant. Don has made, has mastered not just the fine points of legal arguments on the law, but the big picture. But what sets him apart, even in this elite crowd, is his tactical judgment. He's at home not only with the fine po points of law, but also on the chess match of how the case is likely to play out over time. Second, the passion. He's emotionally committed to his clients and their case. Of course, that was the case for the Affordable Care Act. And I'm told he can tell us that he wept when President Obama called him to congratulate him and thank him on the win. But his passion was just as intense for an inmate on death row that he represented, Kevin Wiggins, in Wiggins versus Smith. He represented him for years at every level, all the way up to the Supreme Court, landing a critical ruling from the Supreme Court establishing the standards for effective assistance of counsel in capital cases. And throughout that time, he was a frequent visitor to the Baltimore jails to visit Mr. Wiggins. One of the traits I most admire in Don is how he has used the unique soapbox he has and the power that he has, in particular when he was the Solicitor General, to make important statements and to do justice. That passion served us all well in one case in particular, Obergefell. I will quote Don's last few sentences because, frankly, I could not match his eloquence. And I urge you to give the whole thing a listen. It is a tour de force of advocacy. He said right at the end. And what I would suggest is that a world, in a world in which gay and lesbian couples live openly as our neighbors, they raise their children side by side with the rest of us, they contribute fully as members of the community, that it is simply untenable to suggest that they can be denied the right of equal participation in the institution of marriage or that they can be required to wait until the majority is ready to decide that they are prepared to treat gay and lesbian people as equals. Gay and lesbian people are equal. They deserve the equal protections of the laws and they deserve it now. Thank you. No, Don, thank you. Thank you for your advocacy and your passion and your leadership and the role model you set for us all. I guess I'm uh, supposed to say something after that, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. That was uh, extraordinarily generous, uh, Josh. I, I, I uh, find moments like this very embarrassing, so you're just going to have to bear with me um, as I quickly change the subject. Uh, 
Uh, it's really an honor to uh, be able to participate in this evening's event and to support the Office of Appellate Defender. It's an extraordinary organization and it does amazingly important work for uh, all of the uh, reasons that we heard about before. So I'm really honored to be here and to be a part of this and to make this contribution. I'm really honored to be uh, with this group of other honorees, uh, each of whom is quite extraordinary. Wild Gotchall and Steve's stewardship doing that amazing work. And Khalifa, I mean, you've got uh, an unbelievable story. You know, we think that we struggle with things in life uh, and overcome obstacles and accomplish things, but it's nothing compared to what you've done. So uh, you're an inspiration to all of us. And uh, Lisa, who, you know, I've won some cases, as Josh was nice enough to say, I've lost a bunch of cases too in the Supreme Court. But Lisa, I think, has, of all the many dozens of cases she's argued in the Supreme Court, I don't think she's lost any cases that she's <laughs> argued, which is quite amazing. Um, but uh, even more importantly, Lisa, you know, you're a great person of integrity, and I'm proud to call you my friend. And, uh, and Teresa, we've known each other a long time, and it's great to be able to share this evening with you as well. So thank you, Josh. Thank you, members of the court, sort of. And <laughs> thanks to all of you for being here. So I've been an admirer of Lisa Blatt's for quite a long time. I'm pleased to say that unlike the case with Don, I've never been Lisa's adversary. I'm pleased to say that because chances are I would have lost. I mean, truly, statistically, chances are I would have lost. I hate to contradict Don. She hasn't won everything. She's argued 35 Supreme Court cases. She has won an astounding 94% of them, losing only two. So how does she do it? I pose the question to the brain trust of Supreme Court advocates. Clearly the consensus is that sheer brilliance has a lot to do with it. But one former Solicitor General said, the real trademark, the real uh, uh, attributes that have been the winning recipe for Lisa have been intense preparation and remarkable agility on her feet. So don't take our word for it. Listen to what the Supreme Court has to say. It has attested to it. So every time cert is granted, the lawyers on the case get a brochure from the Supreme Court. It's called the Guide for Counsel. On page seven, it says this, know your client's business. For an excellent example of a counsel who is intimately familiar with her client's business, see the transcript of argument in United States versus Flores Montano. The court continues, the case dealt with the searching of a vehicle gas tank by customs agents at an international border. Government counsel had a total grasp of why and how the agents conducted the searches and provided convincing explanations to all questions posed by the court. Government counsel was Lisa Blatt. You cannot pay for advertising like that. <laughs> Trust me, I've tried. <laughs> to prepare for argument, I'm told that Lisa actually went down to a customs facility in Virginia to learn how the searches actually work. That preparation came in handy during oral argument when Justice Stevens asked a hypothetical about tearing apart the upholstery on a car seat without, um, and, and, and um, you know, just tearing everything apart. And Lisa gave a detailed explanation of how these remarkable tools are used to search everything and how it's actually used quite for that exact circumstance to sneak behind seats and search. Later came an exchange that really showed not just Lisa's preparation, but the quick wit that is her trademark. In response to a question from Justice Breyer about how searches are tracked, she explained this remarkable nationwide system that tracks positives and negatives. She explained it in detail. 
Then came an interruption from Justice Scalia, which could easily have turned into a disaster for any normal advocate. The transcript reads, the court, is it public that such a thing exists? Lisa interrupts, Ms. Blatt, I've just made it public. <laughs> and then the transcript reads, open parens, laughter, close parens. That rapier whip is Lisa's, is vintage Lisa. Another top entry from the informal poll that I took is Lisa's penchant for speaking truth to power. Carter Phillips, the great Supreme Court advocate, tells this story of something that happened just this winter at the SG's formal uh, uh, Christmas party where all the alums get together. You might recall the Garza case. It it's still going on. It involved the pregnant, undocumented minor who needed an abortion that immigration was refusing her. One facet of the case came when, in a brief interlude, interlude her lawyers won unbank in the D.C. Circuit. She was able to get out and get that abortion under the radar. The Solicitor General was furious and sought sanctions against her lawyers at the ACLU for not going to the government and volunteering the fact uh, that she was going to go out and get this abortion. The ACLU asked Carter to represent them in fighting the sanctions. As Carter tells the story, Lisa accosted him at the SG party, not five feet from the Solicitor General himself and his entire staff. He says, Lisa lit into me for being such a milk toast. She said, at full volume, if I had written the opposition, I would have gone for the jugular. She declared for everyone to hear, I would have sought sanctions against them. <laughs> Carter continues, then she hugged me, she told me it was a great brief, and she just laughed at the look on my face. <laughs> I could go on for a while about Lisa's prowesses as an advocate. I'll just say if you want to hear her passion, you have to listen to the argument in adoptive couple versus baby, call, uh, versus baby girl. And if you want to read the most entertaining brief ever written, read Lisa's brief challenging the PTO's decision to cancel the trademark registration for the Washington Redskins on the ground that it was too offensive. It starts by reciting all of the most offensive trademarks that are still on the books. It starts with take yo pounties off clothing, <laughs> then retardopedia. Much, much of the rest of the list I cannot even read in public. <laughs> One last point of consensus that emerges very resoundingly from all of the accolades that Lisa has received is what a great mentor she is. She coaches a high school debate team. She is said to be a teen whisperer, which has earned her an invitation to our home forever. She's also the first to volunteer to moot courts um, uh, uh, to help with the occasional appeal or to give advice. Her mentoring has proven especially valuable to some of the female uh, Supreme Court advocates. One of my partners had her first Supreme Court argument this spring, and Lisa insisted not only on reviewing the argument, but on reviewing her wardrobe. She said, you're wearing cream, a cream blouse? No, you can't wear a cream blouse. It's going to be white, and took her by the hand and brought her to a closet and gave her a white blouse. So Lisa, tonight we honor you for your advocacy, but we celebrate the whole remarkable, formidable, and admirable package that is Lisa Blatt. Thank you for this award. Uh, it is an especially an honor to share an award about oral advocacy with Don Varelli. 
I learned how to argue before the Supreme Court by attending countless arguments during the 13 years that I was an assistant in the Solicitor General's office. Two of those arguments stand out, and both of them were argued by Don. The first was the 2002 case of FCC versus NextWave, and it involved a lot of money at the intersection of telecommunications and bankruptcy. The next was a year later called Wiggins versus Smith, an important death penalty case. I went to both arguments only because a lawyer from the government was arguing opposite Don in both cases. I had expected, as was often the case, to daydream or even doze off until the government lawyer argued, but not these times. Now, I had heard that Don was exceptional, but seeing was believing. Don was electric and magical in his cadence and way of answering questions. It was like watching a riveting tennis match with Don winning every shot. He spoke clearly, forcefully, directly, substantively, and competently, but at the same time, he was humble, conversational, and likable. Incidentally, he won both cases. Watching Don argue those cases left an indelible impression on me and significantly furthered my development as an oral advocate. Don showed me then what a textbook, beautifully polished oral argument looks like, and he inspired me to emulate him. But let's face it, I am no Don Varelli, and very few of us ever will be. An oral argument is like truth serum. No matter what you write out in a script or what someone tells you to say in a practice moot court, when you are under the hot lights of hostile questioning, what comes out of your mouth is inevitably what you really think, and it is uttered in a style that reflects you and you only. As a result, I advise young advocates to listen to great oral advocates like Don, but also to get comfortable with their own style. Oral advocacy is the art of storytelling and the art of persuasion. And like all art forms, there are many ways to skin a cat. I hope Don and I showed you that tonight, and I thank you again. Four years ago, Teresa Roseborough gave a speech on the question, can women have it all? Teresa said yes, but she implored the next generation of talent before her, trust your instincts and write your own rules, and as she put it, it's time to try defying gravity. That's what Teresa Roseborough has been doing her entire career. Teresa uh, has the record here. I've known Teresa for 31 years. And she sparkled then as she sparkles now. Teresa was clerking for Justice Stevens at the time. It was an especially acrimonious time. The term started with the confirmation hearings of Judge Bork. Now, back then, a lot of you may not realize this, confirmation hearings were highly partisan <laughs> and, and even venomous. Forgive me for being nostalgic for those times. But anyway, the acrimony really found its way into the court, and in particular, these passionate law clerks, uh, uh, all of 25, 26 years old. Teresa rose above the fray. She was an old soul. Teresa was brilliant, but not showy. Forceful, but not belligerent. Principled, but not sanctimonious. And always kind. So very, very kind. Those are the traits that have raised Lisa, uh, that have raised Teresa to the upper echelons of every aspect of the legal profession. She was a star litigator in private practice, recognized early as one of the 45 under 45. She had a distinguished stint in the Clinton Justice Department as head of the Office of Legal Counsel. And that's where the really, really brilliant lawyers go to answer the really hard questions. Teacher, uh, 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 Teresa rewrote the rule book for her family right life. Teresa and her college sweetheart, Joseph, raised a stunningly talented daughter named Courtney. Now, most people in these high positions that Teresa has attained would just cart their family wherever she goes. But as a condition, but, but instead, 
It was really important to Teresa to leave the family life intact in Atlanta. So as a condition of joining Janet Reno's Justice Department, she negotiated with, with um, Attorney General Reno an arrangement of flexible work schedule for her to basically hop on a plane and commute back and forth. Teresa has rewritten the rules since then in-house at both MetLife and now as general counsel since 2011 of the Home Beat Depot. I'll mention just a few ways. First is Teresa's commitment to diversity. At Home Depot, two of Teresa's five direct reports on her team of 125 are diverse women, and she has insisted on both diversity and innovation from her law firms. Second, she is deeply respected as a mentor. Diversity is simply not window dressing. She backs her best talent. A few years ago, when, when Teresa was at MetLife, I had a Supreme Court case against MetLife. It was a highly consequential case for the company. On MetLife's briefs were two of the most prominent Supreme Court advocates in the country. But when it came time to designate who was going to argue the case, Teresa chose one of her own, an in-house lawyer who was ex ex exceptionally talented and experienced as an appellate lawyer, but who had never argued a Supreme Court case. Not many in-house lawyers would have the guts to do that, but that was exactly the sort of thing that Teresa would do. Third is how Teresa has continued her lifelong passion for, for civil and criminal justice reform. It's not just that she's co-chair of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and a member of the Board of Overseers of the Rand Corporation for Civil Justice. That would be enough to honor her. But Teresa has brought that passion to the company. At Home Depot, Teresa has been a vocal champion of the Ban the Box initiative which is urging businesses to stop asking the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime on an application, a reform that has changed thousands of lives by giving people a fair shot at employment. A few years ago, I had lunch with Teresa, and we were talking about the things that were on her mind. Civil justice reform always was. It was always a concern of hers that people cannot afford justice, including in the civil context. And one of the things that was keeping her awake at night were disputes with, that Home Depot might have with the occasional customer and how customers could ever afford to resolve them. She thinks Home Depot should always err on the side of just resolving these disputes with customers because then they retain a customer. She has said publicly, kindness is a business imperative. That is not a sentiment you hear in business a lot. So we honor Teresa today for all this, for her brilliance and her sparkle, for caring about others, for fighting about what's right, for being a role model for all of us, and for teaching us all how to defy gravity. It is my deep honor to present Teresa Wynne Roseborough with the 2018 Council for Justice Award. Thank you, Josh, for being my dear friend of three decades and for those awful, painful moments listening to someone talk about me. <laughs> this has been a wonderful evening. It's been so uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to share the, the podium with the Brain Trust, the who's who of the New York Bar Association. Thank you so much for contributing your time and your talent to an amazing program. Don and Lisa, thank you so much for teaching us all about the art of advocacy and letting us see you do it here uh, before us tonight. And thanks to all of you in the audience for being here to support this amazing organization. We are participants in a government that holds amazing powers. All of us hope to return to our homes this evening. But in fact, we have anointed those who would have the power to stop us to take us from our seats in this auditorium, to take us away 
to face reckoning with justice. It is thanks to appellate lawyers that they are obligated to tell us who they are. It is thanks to appellate lawyers that they are obligated to tell us the reason we are being stopped in our normal commerce and our intention. It is thanks to appellate lawyers that we cannot be held out of public eye, that others have to be told who we are and where we are and of what we stand accused. It is thanks to appellate lawyers that the process by which we are convicted must be scrutinized and held up to the assessment of others even after trial so that those like Mr. Perry who are wrongful commitment, wrongfully convicted might one day hope for their freedom to be restored. That is an awesome responsibility undertaken by the members of the Office of the Appellate Defender. And I cannot be prouder than to be the friend of Josh, of Mr. Hyman, of the others who contributed to the creation of this office and the many wonderful life-saving acts that it has created. And in rendering justice a little fair, in making sure that the rules are followed, those lawyers also make all of us better, prouder of our government and our institutions, able to stand proudly in the halls of the court and know that justice is being served. And for those of us who are in the room who are lawyers ourselves, we know how much the work of those who devote themselves to these tasks without the remuneration that many of us earn in our careers, are truly serving as angels among us, making us all better people. And I thank all of you for the opportunity to be with you this evening. Thank you for the humbling honor you present to me this night. It is truly undeserved, other than to thank you for the opportunity to be here and to thank all of you. Okay, the final act of this evening's program will now begin the mock Supreme Court's deliberations. So I note that we have minus two minutes remaining in our deliberations. Uh, so uh, allow me to ask each justice, uh, please, talking with Justice White, to please just tell us what you thought about the uh, case and how you might uh, vote on the case, and we'll just go straight down the line, if that's okay, okay with everybody. Thank you. Uh, first, the advocates for spectacular, as everyone said. Uh, I vote to affirm uh, the ruling uh, below in favor of uh, the respondent on the first question of whether the state of Alabama may execute a defendant with a mental disability that deprives him of memory of committing the capital crime, the, of a capital crime, or the capital crime that he does not recall. The answer is yes. Uh, the Eighth Amendment under Ford v. Rainwright, uh, Panetti v. Quarterman, and our other decisions uh, does not prohibit the execution. As an intellectual matter, Mr. Madison understands that he was convicted of the capital crime of murdering a police officer, and he understands that the state seeks to execute him for it and understands its rationale for doing so. Uh, that is sufficient. Uh, in this case, I think the record demonstrates that the petitioner's vascular dementia and loss of memory do not render him incompetent for execution because although having no memory of the capital crime, he understands that he was convicted of that crime and further understands the state intends to carry out his execution for that crime, a rationale that Mr. Madison also understands because of the seriousness of the crime. Uh, ex execution in these circumstances also serves the retributive and deterrence objectives of the state. Under revolving uh, standards of decency, uh, demonstrable vascular dementia, depriving a defendant of any memory of committing a capital crime can render a defendant incompetent to be executed under the Eighth Amendment if the defendant's condition prevents him from understanding the rational connection between that crime and the state's decision and intention to execute him. Here, however, the record does not support the requisite failure of understanding, and therefore the Eighth Amendment does not prohibit petitioner's execution. Standards of decency have not yet evolved under the Eighth Amendment to prohibit executions of convicted defendants solely because they do not have a memory of the capital crime they were convicted of committing. Thank you. 
the obvious outcome is to, to vote to affirm, uh, to conclude this uh, defendant is, is, is competent and can be uh, executed. That's the path of least resistance and the, and the sort of way to follow uh, precedent most closely. I would nevertheless vote to reverse on the grounds that uh, the retribution, the deterrent uh, forces uh, do not work here. Uh, we would find a way to establish the, from the principles of the pre-existing cases that a defendant who has to be told what he did in order to uh, justify his execution, to be walked around the room to wake him up and is competent only to be executed, uh, it does not satisfy evolving standards of decency. I would reverse the case. I think the legal issue has been articulated extraordinarily well by Justice White, uh, but I would be in Justice Seymour's camp. And I find it troubling, although it's not uh, pertinent technically that the jury voted eight to four in this case not to impose the death penalty. And so therefore, I would be, first of all, I'm skeptical of the death penalty as a deterrent, but I would also be inclined to conclude that in the evolving Eighth Amendment jurisprudence, that putting to death someone in this condition under these circumstances violates the Eighth Amendment. Superbly argued case. I would join my colleagues in voting to affirm. I think this is a hard case because I think what the relief that is sought here clearly goes beyond incompetence itself. And I also think it's troubling that there are no states that have determined that an execution cannot take place in circumstances like this, which is very different than other cases in which the court has extended the Eighth Amendment, for example, to prohibit the execution of individuals who were juveniles at the time of their offense. But I think the core principles in Ford and Panetti, as Don articulated, are whether you can come to terms with the moral consequences of your conduct. And I think that for a defendant who can't recall committing the crime itself, that's really not possible to do. So I, too, would vote to reverse. I'm going to take the prerogative of going last. Right. <laughs> As the Chief Justice can. Uh, I would vote to affirm, uh, although I am very troubled by the uh, issue of the <clears throat> decency of execution under these circumstances. I think that the um, prevailing questions uh, are, one, whether there is a sufficient link in the, in the petitioner's mind between the crime and the punishment. And I, as hard as I have tried to uh, uh, side with the petitioner on that question, I must say that I don't think the record bears that out. I think the fact that a petitioner does not recall the events does not vitiate the link between the crime and the punishment. Uh, and I think that's the prevailing standard. And I also think that, the, as counsel for the state said, the, the state wins on the deterrence question here. I, do, I just don't see the logic of of the petitioner's argument for the, for the linkage between the failure to re recall the events in question and deterrence. I think as painful as it is to say this, the state has the better argument on deterrence and I therefore would affirm. I uh, have a lot of sympathy factually for the defendant given his diminished state. I wonder what limited value there is for the state of Alabama to put this individual to death at this point after he's been incarcerated for decades and he is in a diminished state. However, at this stage in the legal proceedings, we're not in a situation where his diminished capacity makes it uh, such that he can't defend himself in his legal proceedings. We're past that stage. And the way I le read the law in its current state, I don't believe that we have the, the room to set aside the death penalty in this circumstance. I think the law is such that, um, as my colleagues have stated, um, the death penalty is, is appropriate at this stage. I want to thank uh, both our advocates uh, for excellent arguments in a difficult case. Um, I would apply the test uh, articulated by Justice Powell 
in his concurring opinion in the Ford versus Wainwright, uh, requiring a finding uh, that the individual has a condition that precludes him or her from having an understanding of the reasons for the penalty and its implications. But I would vote to reverse uh, because the record does, in my view, although barely, uh, support uh, such a finding. Uh, clearly, terms like mental illness, insane, delusional, do not describe all the categories of persons who should not be executed uh, to avoid a violation of the Eighth Amendment. They're not adequate in light of the very varied mental and neurological diseases that can seriously impair someone's understanding of their situation. And we should be using broader terminology uh, for conditions that can be measured uh, much better today with a te technology that's available. Uh, but we do need to be careful that uh, we ensure that uh, the record is made with adequate scientific uh, expert psychiatric testimony. So I hope that whoever is assigned to write this opinion uh, will ensure that we include those concerns in our decision. Uh, I don't think the Eighth Amendment or this court's precedents support the extension of law that the petitioner needs to prevail in this case. I think in cases uh, in which the crime is so serious that it has resulted in a sentence of death um, for a defendant who's neither insane nor delusional, um, who understands um, why it is that he is about to be executed but just can't remember the crime. I don't think that defendant um, under the Constitution uh, avoids execution. I think the fact that not a single state has seen fit to prohibit execution in that circumstance is very telling to the extent this court has repeatedly looked at evolving standards of decency to determine whether something does or does not violate the Eighth Amendment. Um, I don't think the outcome of that analysis is even close in this case. And so for all those reasons, I would vote to uphold the judgment below. And it was not prearranged that it would be 4-4 going to the <laughs> Chief Justice. <laughs> and if you believe that, right? <laughs> this is a very tough case. As to the first question presented of the application of our precedents to this case, I would agree that neither Ford nor Panetti would prevent the state from executing the defendant in this case, the petitioner. With respect to the second question presented, which goes to the heart of the evolving standards of decency in our society, I am not convinced that the state is correct that a mere spectator's understanding of a crime is sufficient to meet the standard of, that we, of competency that we should require for execution. It's simply not enough that, I have, that a defendant would have the same awareness that someone reading a newspaper might have of a crime, and the same awareness that if that crime were committed, it might justify the imposition of the death penalty without any ability to appreciate that the conduct at issue was actually their own. The record does not show that the state provided any evidence that petitioner is abil has the ability to understand that the conduct being described to him was his own conduct uh, and that his vas uh, degenerative disease did not prevent him from retaining that necessary level of awareness. So that reason I would reverse and remand for further findings on whether or not the petitioner's competency meets the appropriate standard. So we have a 5-4 decision in favor of Don. Congratulations. <laughs> Brian Stevenson argues the case tomorrow morning, for those of you who may be interested. So um, I promise to let him know the outcome this evening, um, <laughs> and I will do that. I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. I really appreciate all of your support, and I look forward to seeing all of you next year. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.